Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about these different methods for constructing random beacons from uh, different cryptographic primitives. This is uh, heavily focused on my uh, work with co-author Ignacio Cascudo, as well as some more recent work with uh, Kasten Baum and Rafael Dowsley and uh, Kira Takahashi and uh, Elena Payin. Um, so let's start. Uh, first, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, review of uh, what randomness beacons are and what we expect from them and then I'm going to survey these different methods for constructing them, ending with some considerations about the different disadvantages of each of them. So what is a randomness beacon? Basically, we want a decentralized protocol that outputs uniformly random and uh, unpredictable and unbiasable values, and we also want them to be publicly verifiable. And Obviously, we also want to have some sort of guaranteed output delivery so we don't have to worry about the availability of our random outputs. If we want to illustrate this with a Japanese theme, say we have our nice Tokyo Tower right here, and then uh, Doraemon and Ampaman and uh, the baker want to learn some random values. They can go to the tower, and at each point in time, they can get a new random value in a way that they all know they are getting the same random value and by trusting the star they know that this is actually um, secure. Why do we care about this? We can use this for example to build proof of stake based blockchains which is uh, in which this is a very important building block. So say we have a POS blockchain with Totoro, Porcoroso and Chihiro each having some relative stake, so Chihiro is a rich one here, and they want to select who generates the next block. We can easily do that by using a random beacon that outputs values that link to each of these coins, and then the owner of the respective coin gets to select the transactions in the next block and generate the next block. Again, we need all of the properties that I said before in order to be able to prove that such a protocol actually achieves consensus according, for example, to the GKL model. Now, some important parameters that we care about when constructing such randomness beacons are, of course, the setup. What kind of setup do we need? Do we need a PKI? Do we need a common reference string? Do we need a trusted third party or what? Um, then the sort of randomness that we get out of this beacon? Do we get biased randomness? Do you get something that's uniformly pseudorandom? What kind of uh, randomness, cleanliness, can we get from our beacon protocol? Of course, the complexity. We want to know how efficient this is, or inefficient, in terms of communication and computation. And finally, what security guarantees we have? Can we actually show that these protocols will survive composition with other protocols, for example, blockchain consensus or whatever decentralized application is consuming the random outputs from the random beacons? One of the first approaches for constructing such um, beacons is so-called publicly verifiable secret sharing, which involves a dealer who share certain um, locally selected random values in such a way that every party can verify that the, val that the shares are valid. Later on, everyone can review the values they have shared and then do the standard coin tossing trick of XORing all of the values together or extracting some randomness from that in a more efficient way, which is actually the approach we take in some of the best constructions uh, right now. Usually the setup is uh, some PKI, and you get something that is uniformly pseudo-random, really, because these constructions are computationally secure. They are not uh, information theoretical. But we can use certain techniques to improve the efficiency. The main result up to 2017 or 16 was that by Barry Schoenmakers that had a complexity uh, a cubed of n, n cubed, uh, where n is the number of parties, and then we finally figured out how to go get that down to all of uh, n squared in uh, scrape, and then in Albatross you can actually generate not only one uh, random output, but o of n squared random outputs with complexity, O of, n o of n squared, which gives us an amortized complexity per um, 
random value that is uh, amortizes to constant. More recently, we also improved the concrete complexity here, the constants of uh, Albatross in this paper called Yolo Yoso, which is geared towards this uh, you only speak once model of uh, MPC by constructing a better zero knowledge proof of share validity. Notice that in such schemes, you basically need to publish encrypted versions of your shares and then prove in zero knowledge that those encrypted shares are valid shares of a certain value. The the main improvements that we've had in this line of work have always been connected to constructing better methods to do this exact zero knowledge proofs. The security guarantees you can get with this uh, sort of scheme are as good as you want them. Uh, universal composability in the case of Albatross. The other follow-up works can also be turned um, universally composable, which means that you can safely combine these protocols with other cryptographic protocols that will consume the randomness. Applications here are, are basically anything that needs any randomness since we get very clean outputs in the sense that we don't get any bias when using this sort of constructions. Some real world examples are the first era of uh, Cardano that used the scrape scheme that we published in 17. Uh, although now the improvements in Albatross and then in Mount Random, which I'll cite later, and uh, Yolo Yoso will give us even better performance. Just as, uh, as a reference here, already in Scrape, we could run this with tens of thousands of parties. Uh, I think that back then, using some Haskell reference implementation by the Cardano team, this we could run it up to 50,000 parties. With the improved uh, constants in, in Albatross and uh, Yolo Yoso, I believe that could go even wider than that in terms of parties involved in the protocol. So PVSS is interesting. It gives you very clean randomness, but it has a clear caveat. You need to communicate and compute too much in order to generate any random values. You need at least two rounds of communication where all parties participate, uh, or say a majority of parties, one where you publish your publicly verifiable shares, and another round where you publish the value you have shared, or where uh, a majority of parties cooperate to reconstruct a value from a party who failed to reveal their share value. So we want to consider other options that will give us randomness with better efficiency. One such option is uh, verifiable random functions. There are basically these uh, pseudo random functions with uh, attached proof that you have evaluated this pseudo random function on a given input, given a secret key that you have. And then people can verify this proof using a public key that you have published already. First uh, time this was. Um, proposed was in the Algorand paper, as far as I know, and then we did some improvements on that approach in the Praos paper, which I'm going to tell a little bit about. First of all, the setup we get here is a PKI. We need the parties to register their VRF public keys for verification, and you need a random nonce to start the protocol execution. And there's a caveat here. The adversary can always add some bounded bias to this sort of uh, beacon because basically the adversary can decide not to publish a VRF output adaptively in order to induce some bias in the final random value. The computation and communication complexities are quite nice so then because uh, there's a basically a non-interactive protocol where everyone publishes a VRF output and in the end you extract randomness from all of these uh, VRF outputs that have been published by the parties executing a protocol. And the security guarantees you can get from this uh, sort of scheme are, again, uh, universal composability, as shown in the Genesis paper, which did a UC analysis of our Uroboros Praus construction. Finally, Applications that can deal with some bias can uh, use this sort of uh, dirty randomness. And one such application is actually a POS 
election scheme. You can deal with some bias in those uh, protocols as long as the bias is bounded and um, the other parameters in the consensus protocol are adjusted accordingly. Algorand and the current era of Cardano run this, uh, Concordium runs this, and other uh, blockchain protocols are also running similar schemes. One interesting thing to notice here is that actually for the best analysis in bounding this bias to work, we cannot use a regular VRF. Notice that a regular verifiable random function has its uh, output randomness, pseudo-randomness defined in terms of a key pair that has been generated honestly. And in these scenarios, the adversary gets to generate its own key pairs, which could induce some bias on the VRF output. In order to counter this issue, we need to construct a VRF with an extra property, which is that even with maliciously generated keys, you still get a pseudo-random output, which allows us to get better bounds for the randomness that we extract, for the bias and the randomness we extract from the ZRF uh, outputs. Another interesting uh, idea following the path of VRFs is considering what basically what uh, DRAN does with the threshold VRFs, of course. As setup, you need some distributed key generation protocol, but then you can get something that is uniformly pseudo-random out, out of this beacon with very low uh, com communication and computational complexities. And the security guarantees, as far as I know, maybe there's some new uh, result that came out, uh, as shown in, in GLOW, uh, were uh, standalone security, although I believe this could probably be uh, made UC secure if you use the right uh, distributed key generation and some variations of the, the threshold VRF. The caveat here is that, of course, at some point you're going to run out of entropy. You should have some way of refreshing the entropy in, uh, that is, that is uh, in the inputs given to this threshold VRF, because basically you're doing a threshold VRF evaluation on a certain input and generating the pseudorandom output together with proofs that this is, is already an actual uh, threshold VRF output, but you should be able to inject periodically some new entropy into that system in, in order to guarantee that what you get is still pseudorandom and that you don't get too much uh, degradation. Um, most applications in randomness can use this, although if you need to seed something, you would need some cleaner <laughs> randomness, let's say. Real world examples are the DRAN project, of course, that everyone who's here must be familiar with, so I don't think I need to talk uh, much about that. Um, and then we come to the la latest uh, rage, which is this whole time-based primitives idea of using cryptographic primitives that ensure that a certain function can only evaluate it, can only be evaluated after a certain amount of time, or that a certain function, uh, that, can, that a certain ciphertext, say, can only be decrypted after a certain amount of time. You need, in order to construct um, this sort of beacons, a setup that is a CRS consisting of parameters for a, verifi for a verifiable delay function or a time lock puzzle. Those parameters are trapped horrible, as we know, so care must be taken in generating this common reference string. But if you manage to generate that and understand the parameters well of these uh, VDFs and TLPs, then you can get uniform randomness. Uh, it's quite nice um, with very low complexity. In then also basically a non-interactive uh, randomness generation phases with very interesting um, corruption thresholds. Can actually show that if you are in a synchronous network, you can get guaranteed output delivery uh, randomness with a dishonest majority, which is a bit surprising, given that this is impossible without assuming this sort of, um, of uh, delay functions. Now, this can be shown to be universally composable. We did this in this craft paper, where I constructed the, uh, a VDF and a time lock puzzle that are uh, universally composable and then apply the folklore of EDF construction and prove that it is actually secure. And also with the TLP construction, we get a little bit better performance 
in an optimistic case where parties are actually cooperating in revealing what they hid inside a TLP versus just dropping a TLP and waiting for others to solve. And we do that via a public verifiability property of our um, TLP construction. A big caveat of these constructions is that they are based on the sequential hardness of certain computational problems, which we don't yet understand quite well. For example, uh, iterated squaring. We still don't know very well how the concrete parameters for these problems relate to their average complexity and to the actual physical delay we get from solving an instance of these problems. There's a number of efforts towards uh, solving this issue. For example, the whole VDF Alliance effort in constructing um, ASICs that solve iterated squaring very fast and then hoping that no one constructs a better ASIC. But still, it would be nice to get better foundations for uh, concrete parameters in this uh, setting. Although it is extremely interesting that you get cheap randomness with under very Stenus um, adversarial conditions. Finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a new approach that we just put on ePrint. Uh, that was uh, actually an idea coming from uh, some people in protocol labs and some people in crypto sets, which said, w why, why not use some physical delay to derive the delay in time based? Uh, cryptography instead of using sequential computation. So the idea here is basically listening a little bit to Einstein and remembering that by sp special relativity, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So in whatever kind of communication we do, we have this very basic foundational physical delay. If we were to send, to use this delay for earthly communication, say, you would still have the issue of uh, easily tampering with devices and extracting keys that could be used to forge some sort of proof of communication. So what these guys came up with was saying, uh, let's go to space. They're actually launching a constellation of satellites for a number of cryptographic applications uh, by leveraging the fact that once you put some satellite up there, it's actually quite hard to temper with the hardware and go and extract keys and so on. The another uh, side effect from putting satellites up there is that communication between er base stations on Earth and the crypto satellites takes a while due to the special relativity bound. So what they came and suggested was, uh, why don't we use this to make a time lock puzzle or verifiable delay function just by leveraging the actual physical delay in order to derive the, the delay lower bounds, which are then very well understood. We know nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Turns out you can actually construct, say, a simple verifiable delay function, assuming that all of our satellites have a PKI, basically they have a secret key for a digital signature scheme, and that everyone else verifying the VDF knows the public key. So a toy example for this construction would be basically a base station on Earth beaming up an input for the VDF to the first satellite who signs that input, then sends it to the second satellite who signs the input and the previous signature, and then to the third satellite that signs this chain of signatures and input all the way to the last satellite that ends up generating a signature on all previous signatures and concatenated with the input, and finally beaming all of the signatures from all the previous satellites to a base station. Now you can use, if, if you say these are, these are for example, uh, unique signatures, you can extract the final output from all of these individual signatures and verify that this is indeed an output of this VDF by verifying the signatures themselves. This is obviously stupid because we grow the, the, the output of the VDF with the number of, uh, of satellites involved in this process. So a big part of making this work is actually coming up with a new, improved, ordered mode signature scheme that allows you to compress 
all of these signatures into one constant size representation while allowing for verifiers to check not only that all of the satellites have signed a message, but that they have signed this message in a certain order. So we come up with a new scheme that improves on this notion that was uh, first introduced by uh, Sasha Bodileva and others. And uh, we can actually use this to then get a VDF using this simple recipe, but with constant size proofs and constant um, bottleneck complexity here in this communication. So this is a bit out there, uh, but if you want to believe, they, uh, I believe that the crypto set people are working on deploying this right now. They've already launched one of the satellites, but you need more, obviously, to make this work with meaningful delays. One interesting theoretical attack, though, is uh, if we remember our teleportation guys, <laughs> this, this picture is told from uh, Claude Crepeau's uh, website showing Yosha and Bennett here in Odaiba, in the teleport station, it's close by <laughs> to this venue. You can use certain entanglement-based attacks to cheat in communication over very large distances. Uh, obviously, you, ca you cannot break uh, the special relativity uh, lower bound, but you're able to send noisy information over long distances in not so much time. And this has been uh, used actually to break, for example, mode prover uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, in an attack that was first proposed in 2012 and then improved in different ways. So that should be taken care of at some point. Um, Another final approach that I would like to mention here is why not take a hybrid approach and instead of using one beacon, going for a combination of multiple beacons, each with their trade-offs. So in this Mount Random paper, we propose this uh, three-layered approach where we start with a base layer that is based on PVSS and hence expensive. It takes a while to run because we have this O of uh, n squared complexity. But then in the end, we get O of n squared uh, fresh random values that then can be used to periodically reseed a threshold VRF layer that's running much, much faster than the base uh, PVSS layer, which in turn can output new randomness to reseed a VRF layer that in turn can run much, much faster. You obviously have a degradation of randomness quality as you go up the, 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 the mountain, but in the end, you can choose the layer that outputs randomness and the quality that you need at the speed that you need, finding the optimal trade-off for each uh, application. The instantiation we propose is uh, based on the Prowse VRF beacon with the um, malicious key generation resilient VRF then the DRAN GLOW approach for the threshold VRF, and the new version of our Albatross uh, protocol for the PVSS layer that allows you to gradually release the random outputs that you produce in a huge batch instead of releasing the whole huge batch um, at once. Although now I believe that we could, we could instantiate this better using the YOLO YOSO PVSS with the better um, zero knowledge proofs of share validity. One question that uh, I think is interesting in this case of combining several beacons into one, and also in the case of using beacons that have some bias, such as VRF-based beacons, is how to optimally extract randomness from this, and what is the actual bounce that you get. We don't really know that yet. Uh, so that's, an, I think, an interesting open question here. Um, just to summarize before I finish, we, we need to always uh, have in mind that each of these beacon constructions has a different efficiency and security trade-off. We can always do PVSS to get large batches of randomness with bad complexity. We can get cheaper randomness, but with some bounded bias using VRS. We can do threshold VRS. They have some sort of a more complicated setup, but they will be somewhere in the middle. That's why we put them in layer two in that hybrid approach. And if you understand well enough the parameters of VDS and TLPs, you can get something almost magical <laughs> by getting uniform randomness under very bad adversarial conditions. Although understanding uh, the parameters is still an important problem here. 
And the, my future perspective, as I said here, is why not combine these different approaches and figure out optimal ways to extract randomness from each of these different kinds of beacons, even using their different outputs together in order to obtain something that is uh, optimal for different applications and different trade-offs. So that was it, and uh, thanks for attending today. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I haven't read the Cascade paper, but just it's a very specific question, the signatures. How does it relate with multi-signatures on different messages? Like, uh, so you've been able to have a better, because basically now you have a way to verify a signature made by different satellites very efficiently on different messages. So I still relate this to a multi-signature type of case. How does it relate to two notions? So uh, it's a motor signature on the same message. Multi-signature can be on different messages, but in your case, it was different message because you include the previous signatures. No, 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 no. In the, uh, in the actual construction, ah, okay. uh, I can go back. Oh, ah. it's a... Uh, it's gone. In the actual construction, in the actual efficient construction using an ordered motor signature, then each satellite just signs the input okay. and we aggregate. So it's a multi-signature, basically, on yeah. the same message. But it, it's an ordered motor signature because it also allows you to verify the order of the signing. Ah, okay. So yeah, that's the, the special property. Okay. That's the property that's defined on an old paper by Sasha. And um, they I don't think there was much work on that, on that notion after it was defined and the first construction came out. Because the first construction is actually quite efficient, but we managed to get a version that does not need pairings. The original construction uses pairings. We wanted to, due to the constraint resources here, we wanted to do something from D-log style assumptions with no pairings. And then the, the extra property is that you get this order verification, apart from the motor signature aggregation. <laughs> ah, probably. Probably, yeah. Uh, we, we're just like trying to get as standard as we could in terms of assumptions and as simple because of the constrained resources. You can't just throw. I think the original idea from the CryptoSat and Protocol Labs guys was to do a, basically a, as an arc computation in each satellite. We're like, no, let's uh, back to the basics, something very simple that you can actually implement in a, in a bad little ARM cortex. <laughs> but yeah. OK, thank you. So the main question I have is, uh, you mentioned having to like, periodically reseed the entropy. Although realistically, like, w what timeline in which do you need to like actually reseed entropy from a? It's an a excellent question. <laughs> That's one yeah. of the things I think we need to that needs more more work on. Uh, figuring out exactly when to reseed and uh, what the degradation is in more concrete terms. I mean, we know that we cannot keep going forever without receding this entropy, right? Like, for th that's simply impossible. But when does it degrade enough? Uh, that's an excellent question. W wh what are the actual concrete bounds? I don't know. I don't think anyone has done it, uh, done that uh, that work yet. And uh, actually, about the receding, uh, yeah, here. Uh, uh, sorry. About, <laughs> about the receding, yeah. so for DRAN, we had the issue that if we were to recede, it would change the public key, you know? And it would be very nice to have a stable public key where we could still receive the research secret. But that, is, yeah, that is not something we know to do, I think. You can receive the input to the threshold VRF, right? Instead of just evaluating the threshold VRF on the previous output, you throw that away at some point and you take an, an, an output of another beacon that is giving you uniform randomness and restart from that. Okay, but then it doesn't lower, it, it doesn't provide you with forward secrecy, right? Like if, you're, if you have a past threshold amount of nodes that get compromised, uh, the whole network will still get compromised. No, not necessarily. I mean, depends on uh, how you realize the underlying beacon for this. Uh, if you make that uh, forward secure in a way or, or proactively secure, you can resist this, this kind of attack. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you.